welcome to the last episode of sci Entrepreneurship, an All Turtles podcast series that takes a look at how science fiction inspires people to envision the future and then create it. To close out, we're going to finish where we started, back with Dan Novi, who recently finished his PhD at the MIT Media Lab, where he co-created the class Sci-Fi to Sci-Fab Rickation. And this time we're going to talk to him about Dune. Dune was written by Frank Herbert and is set roughly 20,000 years into the future, where humanity has spread throughout the universe without much help from thinking machines. Here's Dan. Do you remember when you first read Dune? I would say that I was probably around 14, so I came to it a little bit late. It wasn't actually the book itself that cemented a deep love of the Dune universe. It was that Dune encyclopedia that Herbert put out. So that thing went around our little social group of, you know, we had all watched the movie and are going, what is happening? And then we read the book. No, you got to understand this is going on. They cut this out. But we got that Dune encyclopedia that just basically had the entire backstory. And we were all big D&D players. That's no surprise to find out that we were also role players uh, as well as science fiction fans. But having that encyclopedia was sort of like having a, a monster manual and a player's handbook and a dungeon master's guide for this one distinct specific universe. So yeah, there were these like minutia of information that you could understand certain offhanded references in, in the novel or the film. Is there any technology in Dune that you found really interesting or maybe even in some cases in, in Dune, the absence of technology? Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to talk about, the idea that computers themselves and I interpret it more as, as machine learning and AI being banned, not necessarily the hardware itself, but there's great debate about whether there are any kind of computational hardware in the Dune universe. I mean, it's very difficult to have landing craft or spacecraft of any kind that doesn't have some kind of computational capabilities. Very small gyroscopes. <laughs> yes, very, very small analog things. Perhaps there are no analog to digital converters in the Dune universe, and it's all just analog. But... Yeah, the absence of computers, the absence of AI, and the idea that a human being, if challenged enough, could expand their own thinking and capabilities to fill in these almost superhuman-like capabilities. So the mentats and the face dancers and things like that, I, I also found fascinating as well. Well, and even like the navigational guild, right? That just like right. smokes a lot of spice and mm -hmm. then can bend the universe or something. Yeah, you can warp time and travel through time as long as you got access to that spice. Yeah, all through undergrad, uh, again, this was an early example of us trying to create reality out of science fiction. We had a group of, of friends, comrades, perhaps, who would try to figure out what spice actually tasted like. We would attempt to make flavored experiments, you know, like, is it more clove? Is it more cinnamon? Should there be some bitterness in there? Uh, and you would know you were getting closer based on your ability to bend time and space? <laughs> Let's just say there was a lot of ethnobotanical experimentation going on. So, yeah, we were pretty sure. In there. We were pretty sure. Well, you got to cover up that mushroomy kind of flavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is very, No, not that I know, but I hear exactly. it's very strong. <laughs> very, very strong. A little cinnamon in there. <laughs> Some ginger, maybe. Yeah. And then you just. <laughs> How has Dune in general inspired you to the work that you're doing today? I think there's a lot of small bits of technology in there that are they're one offs or they're they're mentioned in a throwaway line. So there's things like they have a, a, a telescope essentially that uses a, a drop of oil as the lens, but you can change the shape of the the lens to get greater magnification. And it's not explained how it's done, but you know, we put a drop of oil on a little ultrasonic plate here and started bending and shaping and going, yeah, you can actually change the refractive index of a, a drop of oil electrostatically. So there's like little things like that where you can just harvest these small ideas out of the much bigger ideas and assign them to a student to build. So students have did actually build that from Dune? Um, I built that from Dune. Yeah, that was that was a <laughs> quick that was a quick down and dirty. Like, well, we've got this, you know, electrostatic plate. Let's see if we can actually change the shape of a, a drop of of oil. And yeah, indeed, it it could work. I mean, there's still basic limitations because there's always a bit of magic. What if in science fiction? That's really what it's all about. But the basic optics, the science, uh, is is fairly sound on that one. 
One of the things that that uh, kind of really struck me about Dune when I was first reading it was uh, it was the first book to kind of lay out a kind of a systems wide environmental framework that that kind of appealed to me. It spoke about these long term intended and unintended consequences of either thinking through an entire long term system or failing to, and like a, kind of the the ecological and the cultural implications. That was like super fascinating. It was in many ways the first like environmental book that I read, which I'm, I'm not sure if uh, if other people interpreted as that as there or not. Did that resonate with you at all? I think so. When Frank Herbert conceived of the work, he was working with actual sand dunes in in Oregon, and he described yeah, them the Oregon as, dunes, yeah, as as being capable of swallowing an entire city, uh, and but taking a long time to do that. So you know, I'm a member of of the Long Now Foundation, um, yeah, and I th- I think I probably was primed for that kind of thinking by works like Dune, which. You know, first of all, was one of the first things I encountered that had uh, five digits in the date, right? It's set in 10,000 something. Uh, right. And most science fiction, you know, it's like, oh, it's 2300, it's 2400. And I'm like, this is 10,000 something. And you're like, wow, that is that is a long way away. And why don't we have five digits? And so when the long now came along, that was one of the ways they told time. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I get that. I, for me, yeah, a, as you mentioned, this sort of built and well-described universe where things seem to be internally consistent. So this long now kind of ecological approach, this well-described set of governments and church. For me, Dune, growing up nominally Catholic from a large Catholic family, seeing the resonance of of the Bene Gesserit, knowing that that was sort of the remains of the Catholic church and that they were still around uh, because a lot of science fiction sort of wanted to sort of remove religion as a sort of rationalist goal. But knowing that, you know, in the year 10,000, there is something that is still the equivalent of the Catholic Church running around causing trouble for everyone was was also an interesting idea for me at the time. Yeah, and technology too, like the still suit, it's like water recollection. And then also for when someone dies, like the right. recollection of liquid from their bodies. And that was always a really interesting piece of technology to me and like thinking and potentially water becomes more and more scarce if something like that is possible. Oh yeah. There have been uh, a long number of, of email threads on how you would actually construct a still suit, especially amongst our campmates at Burning Man uh, to figure out whether, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be a great whether that it. could actually be, you know, uh, something that you might want to try or do, or whether that was possibly the worst idea ever. And you were probably going to die if you even attempted it. So I think at some point there, there's probably something there. Again, every science fiction idea is the first prototype. The first time you think of this is, is wait, what if we could do this? And then you start breaking it down. At that point, th- the thing is real. You've conceived of it. You've, you've created something out of nothing. And so that first prototype is what sets you on the road. The first thought, the first napkin sketch. So even just sort of figuring out, well, would the pumping action from the heels actually work? Would you want to, you know, process feces in the thigh pads? I don't know. That seems like a bad idea to me. But yeah, certainly mm-hmm. when I have my three liter camelback on at Burning Man, I'm sort of well aware to make sure that it is full before I leave camp. And, and I have a sense of how much is in it and whether it's making noise when I'm moving around. So it's very much like having a tiny, tiny little still suit on and it becomes part of my consciousness. The biggest impact on me from Dune was the Ben Gesserit litany against fear. Mm-hmm. Um this uh you know this mantra that they keep repeating uh, in stressful situations and it was actually it was actually kind of my first glimpse into i guess what i would say mindfulness which didn't nothing came of it until you know 20 years later when uh when i got into a few years ago it was legally required for all ceos in san francisco to get into meditation and mindfulness <laughs> and so i did that and i i really like was sitting there meditating but really i was just reciting the, the litany against fear and found it to be very effective yeah, yeah, the, the, the ability to mantra like repeat something over and over again to put yourself into a, a you know sort of an alpha state essentially to calm yourself down and, and give yourself a bit of focus. I will admit that occasionally I will break out the linea fear internally to make sure that uh, I'm capable uh, and calm when all around me are losing their heads to mix mm. Kipling with Herbert. Sorry about that. Thanks, Dan. 
Dune is one of my favorite stories, I think, this list. And definitely worth reading and rereading. And I would say like rereading and then like rereading like the next few. Yeah. There's like 18 of them or something. <laughs> they got pretty bad. Yeah, there's definitely starts high. Yeah. Just dramatically goes down. I think at some point like Kassan took it over and then his like third nephew or something. But like at least the one that the stuff that Frank Herbert wrote himself, I think, are, are really good. And for me, Dune's always been about just really long-term systems thinking. This idea that you can plan things for months or decades or tens of thousands of years and that the unintended consequences of bad planning can be really significant. It's like, it's the first environmental work that I, that I remember. It's the first work about long, complex systems, about intended consequences, unintended consequences, about AI or not AI. Yeah. Just a, a fascinating and nuanced work. I think I know the quote that res- resonated with you, Phil, the uh, Benny Gesserit mantra. That's right. My favorite quote. I have, I actually wind up, I had this memorized for, for a long time. I probably still have it memorized. And um, this is the Benny Gesserit litany against fear. And I've actually recited this to myself during several times like in my life that have been like significantly stressful. I think I wound up like reciting it out loud at an all hands meeting at, at, <laughs> at, a, at a company that I was running when we were going through some, some difficult conditions. And it was, I don't know if I would do that again. It was maybe a little bit too cultish. Maybe not everyone understood the joke, <laughs> but it isn't a joke. Like it's, it actually yeah, genuinely no, works, works as an example yeah. of mindful thought and functional thinking. I think it's a, uh, it's really good. So the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Ooh, this is the only time we get to talk after a quote. That's right. <laughs> I can see why people thought you were a cult leader. <laughs> we set our KPIs based on the Bene Gesserit <laughs> litany against fear. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna put this into my next entrepreneurship class. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you need to maybe make them recite it to themselves every day in the mirror before they, there you they go. <laughs> look at themselves <laughs> as they read it. And that's Dune. And that was, uh, that was the ninth of our, our nine episodes about important sci-fi works. We talked about uh, Lovecraft, talked about The Matrix, about 1984, iRobot, two episodes about uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. Snow Crash. S- snow Crash. That's right. <laughs> snow Crash. You got uh, Snow Crashed. <laughs> I got... <laughs> and of course, Star Trek. And Dune. And I think the story arc that we were going for here is this idea of agency, right? Of starting with Lovecraft, which is completely despondent and saying that uh, human progress is really just progress towards a, a hellscape Until of your end. Yeah. ineffable death and suffering. And there's really nothing you can do. So you may as well not try anything. As long as you don't do anything. <laughs> exactly. And then progressing from that into uh, more nuanced things like iRobot, more hopeful things like Star Trek, and then really uh, Dune, which I think was a great way to end it, which um, really, I think, symbolizes the, the complexity and the interconnectedness of, of everything. These are the works that have been most influential on me and our, on our guests, a, a lot of other people that have really inspired people to try to make something better than, uh, than what exists. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that we didn't touch on when we talked about The Matrix is it was written by the Wachowski brothers, who are now the Wachowski sisters. And if you look back on The Matrix from a trans narrative, like some ways it's being trapped in the wrong reality. And um, I think that's a really interesting other way to look at it. And especially when you have it also, as we talked about in the episode about Red Pill, and the, the version of Red Pull being co-opted by men's rights activists. And then you also see this film as a, as a trans narrative. It really does encompass so many different realities, and there's so many different ways of looking at The Matrix that I think is, I mean, I don't think men's rights activists are beautiful, but I think that if a story can affect and touch so many different types of people, that's really interesting. Yeah, this, this idea of seeing the world that you want or you don't want, I think— gives lots of people the idea that they can and should work towards changing it. And and not all of those people are going to be changing it in ways that we necessarily like. But it's important to understand where the motivation comes from and, and the shared language that they're thinking about. 
there's this idea that we've, we've touched on before, right, which is how science fiction doesn't actually predict the future. It gives you a recipe for what the future might be like. But but even more than that, it, it actually just tells you everything you need to know about the period that it was written, about what were the people worried about or fixated on. And uh, looking at the, the transformation of that in works that have been around for a long time, like Star Trek, could be fascinating as well. Yeah, if the... Prime directive is a big thing in Star Trek, which is we're not going to interfere with societies. We're going to, until they can leave their own solar system, we're going to back off. In some cases, we'll observe you like scientists and watch you creepily from afar, but we will not interfere in any way, shape, or form. Of course, you find that that is violated by Kirk many times in the original series. The whole show is kind of about breaking the Prime directive. (laughs) In the original series, right? Like, Kirk is very much like, oh, they're, you know, primitive. Like, let me teach them my ways. You watch the original series and you watch a captain like Kirk and then you fast forward 20 some odd years later to the next generation and you get a captain like Picard who really is very much against violating the prime directive or imposing the way we do things on other cultures. And you can see how each series reflects the time and the era it was written in. It was one of the first TV shows that I remember watching. I would I would have been watching it in the mid '80s, and I didn't. I don't think I really understood that this was like from the '60s. You know, it was like in the future. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a, a whole generation of people who grew up in Star Trek with the ideals espoused there just being kind of dogma for for better or for worse. And it was the same. You know, there's obviously different people who worked on the original series and the new generation, but it was, they weren't all different. Like Gene Roddenberry was very much he was alive for part of the next gen. Yeah. Yeah, and like you can almost trace the evolution of the series as maybe the evolution of how he thought about things. And someone who we talk a lot about, obviously we dedicated two episodes to her, is Ursula K. Le Guin and the stories that she writes. What I really enjoy about her is that the technology is secondary, I think. It's really about the philosophy and the people and, and the ideas. And a lot of people, similar to Lovecraft, make the argument, well, that's not really science fiction. But I think how people operate and ideas are just as much science fiction as tricorders. Yeah, I think envisioning something that's different about the world that that she's writing about and then exploring what is that difference and how could that come to pass or not come to pass is the essence of what world building science fiction is. It's why for example, I like I don't think that Star Wars is a similar type of science fiction to Star Trek because Star Wars doesn't really have a coherent view of that world that's like believable and explained. It's, you know, it's a series of action stories which are great but not quite the same as Star Trek or Ursula Le Guin or Dune, which are really trying to be these very believable systems that you can choose to say, well, we like this part of it and we don't like that part of it, but you can't have just one thing without all of it. I think this is the big lesson for our industry, for for tech, for Silicon Valley, right, is that what we do is not disconnected. You can't solve one problem sharply without affecting lots of other things. It is the job of the people who make the stuff to think about all of the consequences, in, intended and unintended. And I think that's what sci-fi entrepreneurship is in a lot of ways. Is 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 brought, we're broadening the the definition of entrepreneur to include people who are system wide thinking. Yeah, so. I think that's right. And uh, so, speaking of Ursula K. Le Guin, we started talking about this idea. We and, started. Uh, let's we started end on quotes it. with her, and we're going to end with her. Science fiction is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world-class Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California, and we were very careful to talk without rhythm so we won't attract the worm. Thanks to Dan Novi for joining us this episode, and thanks to you, dear listener, for tuning in to all nine episodes of Sci-Fi Preneurship. We hope you enjoyed the ride. We'll be back soon with more of our regularly scheduled programming. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this series possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for producing, Chris Plogue for its audio expertise, Allie Packard for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Brittany Gallagher and yours truly, Phil Libin, and all the rest of the All Turtles team, thank you for listening.